2022. We resume our section 194 inquiry. Um, firstly, let me welcome members uh, of the committee, both here at M46 and on the virtual platform. Let me welcome the public protector at M46, as well as advocate in BOFU at M46. Welcome back. Uh, and the entire team of the public protector. Um, welcome evidence leader, advocate Bauer, and your team. Welcome our support uh, staff for the steering work you do. As uh, well, last but not least, our watchers, um, uh, custodians of uh, whatever that we do, members of the public, and you know, various platforms, um, YouTube and 408. Welcome back. Uh, today we are continuing with um, witness uh, Lufuna Ndo, and I'm going to ask Ms. Ibrahim to just confirm um, the status of him here. But you would know that would have been uh, disrupted last week uh, by, by nature, um, to where he was. There happens to be a, a, a storm, not just load shedding, and we therefore could not conclude. We would have started cross-examination uh, led by Advocate Mbofu, and that was interrupted. So today we're starting where we left from that cross-examination. Um, and maybe now I invite uh, Ms. Fatima Ibrahim to reintroduce and confirm the status of the witness, just to indicate to everybody, you, you are aware that this uh, committee would have had an in-session kind of a discussion last week, um, in, in which uh, we would have wanted to discuss certain matters and, and uh, would have agreed that there are certain areas that the cross-examination team, and they have declared as such, uh, that they would uh, want to attend to. And uh, it is those areas when we get to that. And uh, I'm going to ask Advocate Mbofu perhaps to leave those areas up until the end. Uh, and then we would uh, indicate at that point what would uh, need to to happen, um, Ms. Fatima Ibrahim? Thank you, Chief. Good morning, Mr. Ndo. Um, Mr. Ndo, on Friday I administered the oath, um, so please be aware that you are still under oath um, for today's testimony as well. If you can please confirm that for the record, that you understand that you're still under oath, please. I confirm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ndo. Um, I'm going to, once I stop speaking, I will have my mic, my mic off. Your mic and that of Advocate Mbofu will remain uh, uh, live and, and working because that's the stage uh, we're at. So we'll start now. And uh, as I'm saying, uh, we've already briefly started by then, so we'll, we'll push uh, between now up until um, lunchtime at Fred and Bofu. Uh, thank you very much. I now hand over to you, Advocate Mbofu, for your continued cross-examination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, good morning, Honorable Chair, and everyone. Good morning, Mr. Ndo. 
Good morning. Yes. Um, yeah, just, just as you start, uh, get closer to the mic so that even if he's closer to you now here, yeah, there are others that want to hear. Okay, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> well, I can see you, even your body language. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we, as the chair has correctly pointed out, we were disrupted by technology and nature. Um, so we we'll continue, I think, where we left off. But uh, before we do that, I just want quickly to remind you of some of the areas that we had covered so that we don't fall into the trap of going back there. Um, we, we, one of the things we established was that the, there was no previous report which um, implicated the so-called politicians directly. Remember that? Yes, we, we, we spoke about it. We covered that, yeah. Yes. In other words, because you remember one of the theories around this particular matter before the committee is that the public protector, quote unquote, removed uh, the um, issue of the implicated politicians. Remember that? I remember, yes. Yes. So yeah. we covered that ground. And just to be clear, you and I had agreed that the, that's why I'm using the word direct. Nowhere had these politicians been directly implicated. But to qualify that, of course, there were, there were findings to the effect that they should take disciplinary action and so on against the administration people, HOD, and I think the financial director to some extent, correct? Yes, in all the reports I've seen, I've seen yes. Yes. <clears throat> and that um, to the extent that Mr. Samuel suggested that there was a so-called revised report where he single-handedly had implicated the politicians directly. You had no knowledge of such a report. You've never seen it. Not to my knowledge. Yes. And um, I indicated to you that <clears throat> that evidence coincides with the evidence of the public protector because she also had never seen such a report despite the fact that Mr. Summers' evidence was that she had given it to you and her. Remember that we covered that? I remember the discussion, yes. Yes. Now, the, maybe just then to, to, to round off that issue, because it's quite important. You and I had also spoken about the role of Section 79 notices. Remember that? Yes, we did. Yes. And um, in doing so, and this was just my terminology, it's not some official terminology, I had likened the Section 79 notices to the Audi letters because they serve the same purpose. Remember that? I do remember, yes. And you confirmed that um, indeed. A section seven nine notice can be viewed in the same light as a section as a, an Audi letter in the sense that it gives you an opportunity to explain whatever it is that at that stage seems like is implicating you, correct? Yes. And we went to the actual section, section seven nine, to indicate, I read it to you, uh, to indicate that um, it actually is directed at only at implicated persons. The section itself, yes. Yes. Um, just as an aside, for example, in, in a different report, I think the CX report, a, 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 an advocate, Hoffman, who was a complainant, had, uh, had raised the issue as to why he was not given the provisional report. And it was explained to him that that section is not for complainants, but for implicated persons. You can confirm that. That's my understanding of the section. Yes. yes. 
Now, I'm not sure if I asked you or didn't ask you if you were aware of the, um, um, it's not relevant for this report, but just to assist the committee to understand the work of the public protector. If you were aware of the um, opinion by Mr. Nema Sisi to the effect that it was not necessary to include the remedial action in a, a Section 79 notice. Were you aware of, of that opinion? Not, not whether you agree with it or not is another issue, but were you aware of its existence? I was not aware. Not you. Okay, fine. Then we'll, okay, then it means I didn't ask you that. And we'll just leave that out here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want us to, to just come back to this issue of, um, of, of, of the politicians. It is indeed, you, you would agree that um, the public protector was quite concerned that the, firstly, that the information, the outstanding information, which the premier in particular had not supplied, should be obtained. Correct. And she went to the extent of asking you to basically write a follow-up letter to the premier to say, where's the outstanding material and so on. Remember that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. And um, in so doing, she did not prescribe to you. She simply said, please do the follow-up letter. Read, read the, um, obviously you, you first had to read the response from, from the premier of the section 79 notice and then request those documents which were outstanding, correct? Correct. And uh, she didn't say to you, no, don't ask for this or ask for that. She simply said, draft a letter for me. And the evidence was that she indeed signed the letter once you had finished it, correct? Correct. Right. Um, and um, the, um, the, the, the report, itself at that stage had been handled by the province, correct? Correct. And the lead investigator was Mrs. Celia. Yes. Advocate Celia. Advocate Celia, yes. yes. Correct. Okay. All right. Okay, now that's fine. Um, and then insofar as the remedial action uh, was concerned, the main persons that it was directed to were the premier along the lines that you and I had discussed, as well as the HOD, correct? Correct. Yes. And and, and the MEC, of course. Correct. Yes. Um, and okay, the issue of the MEC was a, a moving target in the sense that at the time of the incident, for I think a couple of months, the MEC was uh, MEC Zwane, correct? To my recollection, yes. Yes. But by the time the Section 79 notice was sent in June 2017, the MEC was MEC Holwane, if you remember. I, I can't remember, Chairperson. Okay, fine. Um, <coughs> So, just shut. Yes. Okay, good. Not for not for one. K H K H O A B A N E. You don't remember that? I, I don't remember. I don't have a copy of the section seven nine. All right. Oh, okay. You might have forgotten the name, but surely when you ask for the. Um, Section 79 notices, you, you also received the one from the Premier and also the one from the MEC. Or did you concentrate only on the MEC? And rather, on the Premier, sorry. It, it was only the one from the Premier. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes, because you, you, the instruction to you from the PP was to respond to the Premier. Specifically, yes. yes. That one, yes. Okay, fine. All right. Then you may not know. Um, and you may you may not know as well that by the uh, towards the to the end of the of the, the or, or during the time of the report 
the MEC had already also, also been ch changed, and it was now Ms. Uh, Kabate. Were you aware of that? I, I can't recall chairperson. OK, yeah. that's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> right. Um, then the okay so that sorts out this whole um this all the allegations about uh, politicians and the public protector never said to you that you must exclude anything to do with politicians correct there was no such uh, instruction to me thank you person thank you very much all right and now let's go back to to the the issue that you say um, the the Thank you. Um, sorry. You can switch us off our shares. What's the moment I feel? That's a very country. Okay. Let me stay by the way, Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, I was going to say, let's then come to the, while we are talking about matters political, about the um, paragraph 12 of your of your statement, which is the alleged uh, phone call from the from the public protector, um, and just just to be clear, uh, the public protector does not uh, recall making such a call to you, but um, I'm going to ask you questions around some of the things that you. You you state in your in your in your statement, okay, right now, and and I'm asking you as I say from the point of view, not because we're, we're saying no, this is what was said or this is what was not said um, at this stage. We we will deal with that when we when we when we um, when the public projector gives evidence. But I just want to test some of the statements that you put here. <clears throat> um, you had at this stage, you would agree that you, at least as far as you are concerned, the um, you had just seen the report basically for the first time at that stage. Yes, correct. Yes, and. Um, you had had this meeting with um, the public protector, Mr. Nkabin, the Advocate Silia, and uh, Advocate Mlonyen. Correct. Um, so we can call this basically the handover of the report from the province to to your unit, to your task team. Uh, to my unit. To, to, your to unit. my branch, yes. Yes, to your branch. Uh, at this stage, had you already formed the task team or not? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. Now, I want to, to, to test the following. The, you, and let's start with the, the first statement where you were saying that uh, the public protector had, um, was expressing some concerns about Advocate Celia's relationship or doing the bidding for the DA uh, and so on. Oh, and, and that she could pick up that she was working for the DA. That's, that's what you say. I'm assuming this is your own summary or not the exact words that were used by the uh, PP. 
it's my recollection of what, what of, she said. events. So it may not have transpired exactly like this, but more or less the gist. The gist, yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Now you you know, don't you, that in this particular matter, the complainant was the DA, or rather was a, a member and a DA MPL. Yes, I'm aware. Yes. Um and the um, <laughs> some of the role players included what one might call the farming community in that area in Frede. Correct. Right. Um, and the provincial people obviously had more interface with the role players. That would be my assumption, yes. Yes. Right. Now, let's assume for a minute that um, uh, the public protector had some genuine concerns about the relationship or proximity, or call it what you will, between the investigator and the, and the DA. Uh, given the fact that the DA was the complainant, that would have been a legitimate concern, obviously, correct? If she had reasons to... Yes, 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 um, it's a big if, yeah. But let's say, I mean, I'm exaggerating. Uh, let's assume she saw her DA membership card. I'm, I'm not saying that's what we're, we're going to say. I'm just giving you an example. Knowing that, and it doesn't have to be the DA, it could be the SPCA or whatever it is. But, uh, but a relationship with the complainant would be problematic, correct? Yes, if she had such evidence. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, because, as you correctly say, it's the duty of the public protector's office um, to be impartial and um, not to be tainted in any investigation, correct? Correct. And uh, the rules of national justice say that if there is such a relationship with any of the parties, you should recuse yourself. That's just basic. Uh, if you, let's say, you are a member of, I don't know, the <laughs> Presbyterian Church, like the, some witness claimed yesterday, um, and there was an investigation about that, you either would have your duty Normal duty is to declare or to recuse yourself. Normal duty, correct? Yes, in such circumstances, yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's, uh, that would be um, a matter of concern. And the public protector, uh, according to what you are saying, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you are quoting this ver verbatim, but whatever she conveyed to you was that she gained that impression from the interaction that you had just had with uh, Advocate Celia, correct? Correct. Uh, right. But uh, to your knowledge, she never um, took the matter any further. I mean, the, she, the Advocate Celia was not fired from the brief, correct? From that moment, the file was then transferred to us. Oh, yes. In any event, at that point, the, the, that was the whole point of the exercise. It was to transfer the, the file to national, correct? That was my understanding, yes. Yes, okay. Okay, so, okay, fair enough. So even if the concern remained, it would have, from that point, have become irrelevant, correct? Correct. Okay. Right. Now, let's then... Go to the next one. You, you also say that the PP said she would personally be happy if there was no adverse findings in this report. And you've already clarified that that is not this story that is bended about, about adverse reports about politicians. It was a, a, a general statement, not targeted at politicians or soccer players or any category of people, correct? My 
my sense would be it would also include the politicians because adverse findings can be against anyone. Yes, that's what I mean. It could it could involve anybody. It could be the farmers. It could be any of the role players. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. So it was not targeted at any particular group of people. Correct. The statement has made to me yes. Correct. It was was an open ended one. Correct. Okay. Now the um. And you say that the, um, she said to you at that point, she was, it was not an instruction of any sort. I understood it just to be a wish, not a, a specific instruction. Yes. And um, you specifically emphasized the fact, the word personally. So she said she was at, at that stage, according to your memory, uh, expressing a personal view, correct? Correct. Yes. And, um, to the extent that uh, she might have expressed a personal view, um, you did not understand that to have any impact on the work that you were supposed to do, correct? And for me, it, it, it had implications for the investigation. Um, yes, but as you correctly has pointed out, it never viewed it as, a, as an instruction to do something or not to do something. Uh, please come again through you, Chair. I'm sorry. As you correctly uh, pointed out before, you never saw it as an instruction to act in a particular way. Not this not, personal view. No. no. I, I just looked it, at it as, as, as a own personal view. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Now, now okay. You, you, you know, if you fast forward, um, there was... The, in, in actual fact, what happened is that there were more than 10 adverse findings that were made of different types, correct? In the report, yes. In the report, yes. Yes. And the public protector did not say, Mr. Ndo, uh, remember, I once expressed a personal view about this, so therefore everyone must just be absolved, no? Uh, you recall uh, through you, Chair Advocate, uh, both. Both. Sorry. <laughs> I was not there when the report was finalized. Yes. So she wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to express that. that. Yes. yes, but you know, fair enough. But with the benefit of hindsight, having seen the report even afterwards, the, there was no, uh, the, those uh, adverse findings uh, were still there. There were adverse findings, yes, yes. in, in the you. report. All right. Now, um, um, so to the extent that if your recollection of the conversation is correct, to the extent that you may have expressed any personal views, they, they did not affect the final product. In, in so far as there were actually adverse findings. Yes, yes, there were adverse findings. As to the nature, I can't speak to that. Yes, yeah, yes. No, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that just now. All right. Okay. Um, right. Now, yes. Now, can you just tell me, to, just out of curiosity, you, you, so you say then there was this discussion, which I I'm assuming it was informal. It was not a formal meeting or a sitting of some sort. No, you, she, she, she called me on my cell phone. Yes. Now, you, you, you then say you informed Advocate Celia after that. What did, you inform, what did you say to her? I, I informed her about uh, the discussion uh, since Advocate Celia had been the lead investigator in this matter. I informed uh, of the conversation that the public protector had with me mm -hmm. uh, to say she was of the view that she was doing the bidding of the DA mm -hmm. and also that she had said to me that she would personally be happy mm -hmm. if there are no adverse findings in the report. That, that's what I, I indicated to Advocate Celia. Yeah. And, all right. And... Why did you do that? 
course advocate Celia had been uh, intimately involved in this investigation. In the, in the investigation. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, the um, okay, but let, let us just go back a little bit to this question about the the personal views of the of the of the public protector. You at that stage were aware that she had had the files for some time. I mean, she she had some views on the on the on the file. Okay, let me put it this way. While it was your first time to interact with the file in that meeting, she had had the file for a number of months, correct? Uh, my understanding uh, through you, Chair, is the file. I don't know if we're, we're speaking here, Advocate uh, Mpofu, about the file mm. or a draft of the, of the report. Yes. My understanding was that the file itself, mm. before that day, either in September or October, when it was brought over to head office, mm. she had not had uh, okay. the file itself. Fair, fair enough, yes. yes. No, yeah, we need to distinguish between the two. So shortly after her employment, she obviously had, uh, I mean, this was a, there was a buzz about this particular investigation. It was in the public domain, correct? Yes, it was. Yes. So at the very least, she would have had the preliminary investigation from around October 2016, correct? I would assume so. Yes. And you were having this conversation almost a year later, correct? Yes, plus minus. Plus minus, yeah. Uh, so unlike you who were interacting, was interacting with this matter for the first time, she would have had some interactions with this matter in the form of the preliminary report and also possibly in two or three or four think tank meetings that would have happened since, since her appointment, correct? I, I, Chairperson, I can't speak to the number of think tank meetings, but uh, yes, it, it would have served before any think tank meetings. Any think tank meetings, yes. yes. Any think tank meetings that would have taken place in that period, correct? Yes. And think tank meetings were quarterly meetings, correct? Yes. Okay. So, but, and she had been there at that stage for, let's say, three quarters or four quarters, correct? Yes. All right. Um, but then you give, okay, then you give, um, you give um, um, the evolution, for lack of a better word, of the report, the, the various drafts that were produced uh, subsequent to your involvement, correct? Yes, correct. Right. Okay. Then the, the other issue that I then I wanted to converse with you was the issue of the uh, Gupta leaks. You know, it's one of those things. It's easy now because we're now in 2022. And, you know, we think of it, it's difficult to think of it situationally at the time. So it's important to put it in perspective. You would know that at this stage, the Gupta leaks um, came out sometime in 2017, correct? Yes, around 2017. Yes. And at the time that we were having these discussions, this was, again, another national buzz, the, the, the revelation of these Gupta leaks, correct? Correct. Yes. And the, um, um, I don't know if you are aware that, in actual fact, there's evidence that has been led here and it may or may not be before your time, but there's evidence that has been led here oh, <laughs> that um, actually it was Advocate Celier who was against the use of the Gupta leaks. 
Were you aware of this? If you, or are you aware now? Or have the evidence leaders uh, told you about it? I am aware, Chairperson, because she spoke to it at a think tank meeting to indicate that from her view, the complainant was only interested in matters of uh, maladministration. And not a and not good talent. Yes. Yes, okay, good. So, it's fine. Um, and I think then, yeah, I think we're talking about the same meeting, yes. And in that same meeting, the public protector had actually expressed the opposite view that the Kuptelix should be used, correct? She said there was no harm in, in looking at them, yes. In looking at them, yes. Um, and there was also a view um, that at that time that the... This, remember, the Kupta leaks covered a wide range of issues. I mean, uh, uh, um, I don't know how many, but a wide range of uh, allegations of, of corruption, dozens and dozens of incidents, telecom, escom, this, that, and the other. That, that's what those uh, emails revealed, correct? Uh, I, I can't really recall, but I, I know they specifically also dealt with free edit. I can't remember what else. What else? Yes. They dealt okay. with Chairperson. and use. Yes. Okay. No, that's fine. The, the, I'm sure the, the, the committee will 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 have other evidence, or, or they would be aware of the, the wide ranging nature of, of of the leaks. But the other thing that was uh, prevalent in the country that at that time was that um, the, the public protector had um, uh, proposed, for lack of a better word, the establishment of a commission of inquiry specifically into, let's call it Gupta corruption, correct? Correct. And that... Um, commission was actually a product of the public protector's office uh, in the sense that it was initiated by the public protector, correct? Correct. And the entire topic of so-called Gupta corruption was the central, at that stage at least, the core function of that um, uh, proposed commission, correct? Uh, my understanding through you, Chair, was it, it dealt with uh, state capture in general, although the Gupta issue would have been part of it, yes. Yes. Okay, again, <clears throat> we must think, not think uh, ex post facto. Of course, the um, if, as we all know, uh, the Zonda Commission, which is what it became, uh, dealt with wide-ranging corruption. It was not confined to the Gupta corruption. It dealt with Bosasa and all sorts of other things, correct? Correct. Yes. But as, as someone who worked at the public protector, you may or may not know that the actual mandate of the commission that, that had been suggested by Advocate Matanzella, the scope thereof was limited to the Gupta corruption. I, I can't recall, Chair. Can't recall, yes. In, in the world, uh, uh, I, I can because I was involved in, the, in that litigation. But um, the, um, an illustration of that is the fact that the, what really drove the proposal, you may or may not know this, I'm asking you a question. What really drove the proposal of Advocate Matoncella to suggest this unique um, solution of uh, uh, basically um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Outsourcing that particular investigation to a commission of inquiry was the question of costs, correct? Um, I'm not privy to Advocate Matonsela's thinking, unfortunately. No, not thinking. I'm talking about the what was in the in the public domain. 
um, and litigated about, you know, there's a question of who, whether the president should appoint the commission. These were matters that were in the public domain. But I'm asking you, not as a member of the public, but as a, an insider in the, in the public protector's office. Um, you, would have, you may or may not know that um, Advocate Matonsela, and I'm supporting your view that it then became completely something else. Advocate Matonsela actually at that point had said, had um, estimated that commission or investigation that it would cost 131 million rand, which the public protector did not have. Uh, or, or an amount, you don't have to know the exact amount, but it was the, uh, because the public protector did not have the capacity to to do the investigation, according to her, at least. Chairperson, I, I think I've answered the question to the best of my knowledge. Without having a look at, at the documents that uh, were before I forget my I'm, I'm really unable to... Okay, so even as a senior person within the, the public protector's office, you had no knowledge and I'm, uh, I'm assuming you did not work directly on the state of capture report, but are you saying that with all the think tanks and all the discussions and so on, you did not know that uh, there was a view on, on, of the public protector, or rather you did not know the reason why this work was um, outsourced to a commission of inquiry? I can't recall the reason, Chairperson. Was, it was not discussed at Think Tank or Dashboard or whatever? Not, not that I can recall, not Chairperson. Can recall. Okay, yes. that's fine. Uh, all right, be that as it may, the, um, uh, the, the point I was really making is that, so there was also a sense that uh, uh, for th those people who supported the view of Advocate Celia and others, that uh, the Gupta leaks should not be considered, that naturally that's something that was going to be investigated in the public protector inspired. You are blessed. <laughs> and now you are revealing my secret. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in the public protector inspired uh, investigation or commission of inquiry the, as part of the so-called Gupta corruption. Were you aware of that? Come uh, again through you, Chair. Okay. I'm saying it looked like at some point there were two camps or two views on the use of the Gupta leaks. And I'm saying, let's say the public protector's view was that there's no harm in the Kuptalix being used, correct? Yes. And Advocate Celia and maybe other people were of the view that there's, this, the, the, there's no, no place for the Kuptalix in this investigation, correct? Correct. Yes. Now, I'm saying, and, and I'm not, when I say camp, I don't mean like the, there were people fighting. But I'm simply saying, uh, on the view that was saying the Gupta leaks should not be used, one of the motivations was the fact that that whole issue of Gupta corruption in any event was part of a public protector inspired commission of inquiry. So it would be investigated there, it would be better investigated there. Were you aware of that? Uh, not I wasn't. Okay, so that's fair enough. Okay, then we'll, we'll just bring evidence uh, about that. But um, you, you would understand, I'm sure, just at the logical level, that if there were, if there was, let's assume it was not a commission of inquiry, let's assume the state of capture uh, um, inquiry was continuing internally within, within the uh, public protector's office. It, it would obviously make sense that the, the same thing should not be investigated on, in two invest, parallel investigations as a matter of logic, correct? Yeah, duplication of, of, of investigation and waste of resources. So resources, so. yes. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, 
And in any event, again, uh, reversing the clock a, a, a bit, the reality of the matter is that by the time these Gupta leaks came to surface, this particular investigation was at an advanced stage, correct? Yes, uh, my understanding was that it was virtually complete since the Section 79s had already been issued. Yes. Um, and to start basically on a new uh, issue would have delayed, obviously delayed the production of the report, correct? Uh, through your chair, I, I, I wouldn't agree with that because for me, the, the specific issues that I wanted to be looked at related to the use of the monies by Estina, which, which wasn't really a new issue That's because it's, it's, it's about the funds that, that were, you know, paid to, to Estina. It wasn't a really, really a new issue. It was just about the usage, usage sorry. Yes. Of the resources. Okay. No, okay. I think we're, we're talking at cross purposes. Yes, I'm not saying that the issues that were raised there were, were not relevant. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is that the... Firstly, we've agreed that it would be undesirable to have parallel investigations. But I'm also saying you yourself at that stage did not know, um, for example, the, 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 the bulk or the, or the amount of emails contained in the Gupta leaks that involved specifically the Freire matter. You, no, you, no, I did not. Yes. It could have been two emails. It could have been 2,000 emails. You didn't know. Yes, I did not. Yes. And assuming that it was a lot of material, I'm saying then going through all that, when, as you correctly point out, the report was virtually finished, would have cost more time, obviously, to open a new avenue, any new avenue, correct? Not a new issue. The issue was there, but let's say to go through 2,000 uh, emails. I'm, again, I'm, I'm just exaggerating to make the point, to, to understand the point. Uh, for me, through you, Chair Advocate Mpofu, mm -hmm. just getting access to bank statements, for example, of Estina, mm -hmm. would have at least given us the assurance that I was looking for. Yes, no, that, that, that is true, by the way, and that's actually contained in the, in the report somewhere uh, in Mr. Nemesis's email, but we'll come to that. And all I'm saying is you did not know if the bank statements you're talking about were part of the... You had never seen the Gupta in, uh, emails yourself? No, I had not. So you did not know what was contained in them? Yes. Yes. And, and I, I think that simple point I'm trying to ask you to express a view if you if you are able to is that it, the mere fact that the report was almost finished would have been one of the disincentives to open a, a new can of, 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 of worms, so to speak, a new um, avenue which may involve uh, thousands and thousands of, of, of emails which will also lead to further investigation. That exercise obviously was going to cost time. I don't, I'm not, I don't know whether it would be two months or three months or two years or whatever, but it would take time, correct? It's possible, yes. Yes. And you also know, uh, I think we covered this last week, that this particular report, there was tremendous amount of pressure about this release, particularly from the DA, correct? Yes, uh, Chairperson, uh, and if I may add something, mm. uh, there was also the issue that the, the very party mm -hmm. uh, that was, you know, putting pressure to release the report had actually made an undertaking to provide more information. So from where I'm sitting, Chairperson, I would have been surprised for them then to go to court and say release the report when they've undertaken to give us more information. So yeah. that, that, that was my thinking. No, I... I I agree. Actually, it was a strange set of circumstances because in the public domain, they were threatening to go to court, to take you to court for not releasing the report. And yet one of the outstanding 
pieces of information which you listed, I think at paragraph seven of your memorandum, was the fact that they owed you some information, correct? Yes, and, and that's, that's information that they actually volunteered to, to provide to us. Yes, and in fact, as it happened, you released the report without ever getting that information from the DA, correct? That's my, my, my recollection, yes. yes. Mm. Okay. But, okay, we'll come to that. For now, the point I'm simply making is that there was an extraordinary amount of pressure on the public protector to release the report. Yes. Yes. And we... Uh, on the one hand, putting aside now this contradiction, uh, it, it was understandable because this this um, uh, complaint had initially been laid in 2013 already, correct? Yes, 2013. And, yes, and we were now in 2017, four, four years later, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. And the, in fact, this... I think if you or someone else has testified about this in that this um, you, your team was really under pressure to deliver on this report to in, also because the public protector had made undertakings to the to the DA to Mr. Maimane and in the free state legislature that it would be released soon. You may or may not be aware of this. Mr. Samuel confirmed it. Were you aware of that? Uh, um, I can't say recall your person. Yes, no, it was fine. Yeah, fine. Yeah, there, yes. There's already evidence of, about that, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, and so even uh, the public protector being under that, even being under that amount of pressure, have you was still that the Gupta leaks? Uh, there's no harm in them being looked at, correct? I, I wouldn't say so because uh, that view was expressed, if I recollect correctly, at a think tank mm -hmm. that took place around August mm -hmm. and in September. Uh, I, I did raise the issue with the, and Mr. Nemasisi, and I did not receive a response. And I recollect also raising it at a task team meeting, and she said we're not looking at those. Okay. Yes. So, all right. The first time when you raised it, you're saying there was no response, positive or negative? Not that I recall. No. Uh, not that you recall, yes. And... Um, when you raise it again at that stage, it, it would have seemed that um, the views of Advocate Celia had prevailed. In other words, that, that, that was the position that was being taken, correct? With hindsight, yes. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Then, um, if we can then move to um, uh, bundle H, the Cotelix email, um, bundle H item nineteen. <laughs> Slow sample, are you getting there? Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, Chair, I, I, I've just dropped my glasses now. It looks like I need them. I was well, able to. They have made it bigger now. It was too small.
Are you able to find them? Uh, yes, sir. I was protected by the public protector <laughs> from blindness. Uh, I might have to separate the two of you. <laughs> then you see, then you just want me to be permanently blind. <laughs> I know that. You're just... <laughs> right. Um, just get it on, please. Tap on. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, let's start at the, at the beginning. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry, go back, Tepo. Right, no, no, just fell down after the Kuktelix thing, yes. This is an email um, from the public protector, advocate um, Kwabane to the CEO of PPSA, Mr. Samuel, and uh, Advocate Erika Silia, CC Linda Mulelekwa and uh, Punasaho Mukhaladi. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. I know this is uh, before your involvement, but I just want to um, bring this to the attention of the of the committee. So she says, dear CEO, follow up with Free State uh, Provincial Representative to prepare letters to Premier MEC Minister Zwane for my signature regards the below Gupta League's allegations in this, in addition to the section nine, seven nine letters issued. See that? Yes. Then she says, I will, give you the hard documents sub submitted by Alta. Uh, that's an organization. Um, then it says, Estina, KPMG, and the wedding expenses. Then she says, the free state government gave Estina, an unknown company, free land to empower locals. It also promised 114 million in funding without a tender, ended up handing over 210 million. Gupta has denied involvement. We know they lied. Okay, on. And so what happened to the money, she says. Uh, 84 million was diverted to Dubai. Only 1.7 million was used to buy dairy equipment. The rest was laundered through the various Gupta-linked companies before coming back to South Africa. That's one. 30 million was sent back to Lingue to pay for the Gupta wedding. Example of expenses includes 2.3 million for scarves and 250 for fireworks. Meanwhile, Estina's sick, malnourished cows were dying and discarded in a ditch. <coughs> Lingue claimed the wedding expenses as a business expense, and so, and so on and so on. Um, but this was a, a catalog of the some of the um, allegations extracted from the Gupta leaks, okay? Yes. But I'm simply putting this to, I know that, as I say, I know it was before your time, but you would agree that this kind of inquiry uh, cannot be come from someone whose mission in life was that the Gupta leaks must be swept under the carpet, correct? Yes, having seen that email, yes, correct. Having seen it, thank you very much. Um, but then we go to the issue of you. You have never received any instruction or observed any effort to. Uh, uh, let me start here. The, it is indeed so that the um, Mr. Jenkelson had. <coughs> 
issued what I might call for lack of a better word, staggered complaints. There was one, I think, in 2013, there was another one in 2014, and another one in 2016, correct? I, I recall two. Yes. Not three, Chairperson, but uh, I speak under correction. No, that, 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 that's, uh, I, I, I can understand why. Um, but in any event, the complaints that were sent were rolled into one. They, they were considered together, correct? Correct. Because there were overlaps between them in any event, correct? Yes, correct. Yes. But more importantly, this is a point really I want to make, is that at that stage, and if you know about the subsequent investigation, I want you to disabuse your mind of it for now. In neither of those complaints by Mr. Chenkelsen was there any allegations about the direct involvement of politicians. It was about maladministration aimed at the HOD and people like that, correct? In my recollection, yes. Yes. It is true, and, and just for, for the sake of the information of the committee, it is true that subsequently, in 2018, sometime, I think in April, uh, Parliament then asked for a specific focus on politicians and particularly the issue of beneficiaries. But that's not what I'm talking about. At your, up to the point of the release of the... Of the um, report. It was based on the complaints of Mr. Jenkinson as they stood at that time, correct? Correct. And those had never, apart from them being merged, they had never been narrowed, correct? Correct. Correct. Now, uh, then the next point is the inflation of prices. You remember that old topic? I do. Right. The, okay, here, and, and it goes back to your point about uh, banking details. You have said, and I can understand why, you would have loved to see the banking statements of Estina, correct? Correct. Because that would have assisted you, for example, to see exactly where the money was spent. Correct? Yes, correct. And that would have assisted you in particular on this topic of the inflation of prices. So let's say, for example, the bank statements would show that they bought water for 1 million when you think it should have been 100,000. Then you would know that um, there is more or less some inflation of prices, correct? Yes, that would be one of the issues. So one of the issues where it would have assisted you, yes. <clears throat> Now, and by the way, I think Mr. Namasisi also raised this in when he was making his queries. Whether is, is it is it not possible to dig down into the actual um, uh, the actual spend? Correct. Yes, correct. Yeah. But as it happened, the you, you never we were not able to go that far to get to the concrete numbers to say these were the actual rents and cents. Uh, that's why you're saying you would have loved to have access to that information, correct? Correct. With some of, of, of the purchases, yes. Yes. And again, I know that you are not, for the reasons that we discussed last week, you are not involved in the, let's call it the literal final stages of the preparation of the report because you are on leave. Correct. Correct. Yes. Um, but it, it's clear that at some point a decision was taken that, despite all these um, uh, uh, the few missing links, including the information owed by Mr. Maimane, the report must be issued. Correct. Based on the fact that it was issued on the eighth. I would say yes. Yes. And in fact, your view, your personal view, was that the report could have been issued even earlier, I think even in, towards the end of 2017, correct? Yes, based on, on, on the issues that were 
were approved for the investigation. Yes. That you already had. Yes. Yes. Despite the, as I said, despite the fact that there were one or two outstanding issues, but uh, it could have been issued at that stage. I think around about. I think your view was that it could have been issued in November 2017. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. So there would have been nothing untoward if your wish had been followed through. There would have been nothing untoward in issuing the report at that stage and simply maybe indicating that, well, we've waited for Mr. Maimane, and I'm sorry, I'm using it just as an example, but we have sufficient findings, negative findings, uh, that we've made adverse findings uh, which require action, correct? Correct. Yes. And to the extent that the information given by some of the people involved in the, in the investigation to the public protector that um, there were financial constraints, you were not, you were, you, you were absent, you, you, you were not part of that discussion. I, I was not privy to any such to, discussion. To that discussion, yes. And in fact, I, I like your, the, how you articulate it. The way you articulate it is as follows. You say that, yes, there were financial constraints, as we all know, correct? Correct. Uh, and you say that those financial constraints obviously had an impact on not just this investigation, but all the work of the office, correct? Correct. Yes. And I think your view, and you don't put it higher than that, is that those financial constraints would have affected this report and other reports, correct? Uh, perhaps just to, to, to put a rider, my testimony is that uh, it wouldn't have put any undue pressure on this report more than any other, because the public protector has always had uh, financial, financial constraints. Assistance. Yes. And that's, yes, no, uh, yes, no, no other than, uh, there's no difference between what we're saying. And that um, the, we've had stories about austerity measures and so on. So that the issue of financial constraints was always a factor anyway, it, it, even in other reports, correct? Yes, correct. Um, um Yes, so yeah, I, I do not want to misquote you. The way you put it, you say there was no reason why this investigation was particularly subject to those constraints any more than any other PPSA investigation. In other words, you acknowledge the existence of the financial constraints, but you are saying that those affected other investigations as well, correct? That's what I'm saying, yes, correct. Thank you. Right. And then... Um, so we can then say that one of the uh, let me say some of the weaknesses or, 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 or shortages or areas which you had not optimally covered uh, despite your view that the report was ready for release would have included a, the information on the beneficiaries from Mr. Maimane, which was still outstanding, number one, correct? Correct. And what you have called a more detailed uh, runs and sends information about the spend, correct? Correct. As well as the um, what the public protector calls um, a more scientific um, uh, analysis of the of the costs, correct? Correct. Yeah. In other words, 
while <laughs> someone might say, I'm just going to give you an example. The, the, you remember that in one iteration of the, of the report, there would have been those pictures of the, the construction on the gate as an example, right? Yes. Yes. And uh, there was a, what one might call a, a naked eye analysis. So somebody takes a picture and they say, this gate, and I don't know the actual cost, this gate, um, it is claimed a million rand was used to, to this gate, but when you look at it, it's probably 100,000. Don't worry about the figures. I'm just saying that kind of analysis was done, correct? Uh, through you, Chair, my, my sense of the pictures was to compare what you see depicted in the picture mm. as opposed to what was actually charged. The claimed cost. Yes. Yes. No, that's exactly what I mean by mm. what I call a naked eye analysis. Okay. So it, 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 would, it would then mean, you just say, I mean, it's like if you say, you know, you give me money and you say, what did I spend? And I say, I bought this pen, but you gave me 10,000 rand. And from the naked eye, it looks suspicious, correct? Yes, from an overview point, yes. Yes, yeah. But that's a different exercise altogether from actually taking the pen, putting it there, analyzing it, finding the price, and finding that it is actually 200 rand and three cents as opposed to the claimed 1,000 rand. That exercise was not done, correct? Three, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to recall what was specifically done here. Yes. Uh, my, my recollection is that uh, there would have been perhaps invoices, but I speak under correction. Yes. And, and, and then to go and, and take the pictures Mm. Yes, to see no. if, if something like that then would merit yes. you no, know, that, no. that kind of, of I, money. I agree. Like, fact, whether it's scientific advocate in Bofu, to the extent that you want it to be scientific, mm. I don't know how scientific that would, no. that would no, be. No, it's not, but that's not even the point I'm making. <clears throat> and your recollection is correct. So what I'm saying is that, yes, if you take my example, there would have been an analysis of a picture of my pen or the gate, and then there'll be the invoice of what was spent. You're quite right, yeah. But what I'm saying is that even in your recollection, what the missing link was the fact that there, were, there was no analysis of the actual cost of the pen, because the, the full cycle would be the cost, the actual cost, the claimed invoice, the picture, and then you say the two don't match, which means that if there was an inflation of the price by X amount. That that whole full exercise was not done. No, no, no one said I uh, have looked at it, what is on the ground and it merits what, what was charged. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, despite those, uh, I've just picked up three what I call uh, shortages or, or things that were not done. You felt comfortable that the report was ready for release, correct? Yes, based on the fact that uh, okay. uh, it had also gone through the think tank. And, yes. and, and basically the findings that we had there could be supported with the evidence that was found at yes. the time. And Yes, thank you. And the findings that you did make were uh, serious enough for action to be taken, correct? Yes. Thanks. Right. Um, then if we can then go to sorry. And the, the view that the report was ready for, for release around about November, was was it just your own view or was it also shared by others? October, I'm sorry, uh, November 2017. 
My sense is that it would have been shared by others. Yes. Because once the matter goes through the think tank and they suggest changes, it means once the changes are made, then the office basically is happy that the report can go out. Yes, so subject to the usual quality control checks. Yes. Thanks. All right. Now, okay, before we get to the other issue, I just want to converse or reconverse an issue. You've really already covered this, but uh, for the sake of emphasis and to assist the members, let's just go back to the issue of the Section 7-9 uh, notices. Um, do you recall that the, the, okay, let me start by just playing open cards as to where I'm going with this question. The version of the, of the public protector will be that despite all this noise making about um, uh, alleged exclusion of uh, direct involvement by politicians, which we now know doesn't exist. Um, the actual opposite is true, that as you correctly pointed out, you kept on digging to make sure that the information is received. I think we've covered that, correct? Yes, we have. Yes. But more importantly, that to the extent that any of the of the um, remedial action, which might have been there before uh, and uh, did not find its way into the final report. That was a result of how it should be, like the Audi letters. So where explanations were given, she couldn't just carry on uh, putting the, the information, even when a, a, an explanation has been given. You would agree with that approach. That's the purpose of the Section 79 notice anyway, correct? Yes, uh, Chairperson, and just to indicate remedial action might actually change. For example, if you write to an HOD and you say this is the proposed remedial action, and he or she says one that you are proposing we've already done and so on, hmm. then the remedial action would actually change in line with that. Yes, it, it can change. Absolutely. And to go back to our analogy, uh, it would be ridiculous. For example, in your case, when you are given an Audi letter, you've taken us through, you gave a detailed response to it. And as you say, that was it. Nothing happened after that, correct? Correct. Um, in fact, the public protector should be attacked if, despite your very detailed Audi letter, she just took it and threw it in the dustbin and say, I'm charging low anyway. That would be wrong, correct? I'm not sure, Chairperson, if it's uh, the public protector who took the decision. No, okay. No, no. I, I mean it in the generic sense. Anybody to whom you directed the Audi letter, uh, if they did that, that would be unlawful, correct? Yes, correct. Thanks. Yeah. Now, if, if you then take, if you go to bundle E, item six, um, that's the third uh, rule 53, Tepper. Uh, so bundle E, item six. Um, I think it's the Fred five. Five two. Okay, just patience. They're looking for it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, 
Is that a fine? Um, At least the second part of the Rule 53 record, you just need to tell us what page you're on. Yeah. But yeah, we're in the rights report. Yeah. But uh, item six bundle E. And the page one zero zero two, maybe that's what's missing. I didn't give you the page number. Sorry. And go to ten o two. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay, now, sorry. That that is the um, section seven nine response from Premier. Uh, Mahashul. Um, and that's a document you would have had a look at, correct? Correct. Yes. And I'll just take you through some of it. I, I don't expect you to remember it. It was a long time ago. Um, but um, let, let's go, for example, okay, let's just roll it down. Right. The first issue there is National Treasury Report. That's the one that they're going to now. Uh, if you can go to 10.04. Okay, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Let's go back to 10.03. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is just... Um, also to assist us with another issue which was raised yesterday um, incorrectly. You know that the public protector was, let's call it, averse to relying on other people's investigations, correct? In other words, you could refer to an investigation, but you couldn't um, kind of transport it holus holus into your own investigation. You still have to do your own investigation, correct? Yes, that's the procedure. That's the procedure. And to the extent that um, there the might be, uh, and I'm saying here, here we know that the genesis of this particular issue was an, an inv investigation which was done by ENS, which is a law firm, ENS, ENS Forensic Reports, correct? Correct. Yes, but that report is not is not uh, reflected in the, in your ultimate report. It's just part of the historical documents. Correct. correct. Right. Okay. Anyway, if you go to ten o four, again, I'm just avoiding having to read the whole letter. I'm just going to take some 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 highlights here. Let's take this part here. So the premier says, remember one of the issues 
that he is being accused of or by you, uh, I don't mean you personally, mm -hmm. but by, by yourselves, is that he has failed to take um, disciplinary action. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he says, at the time when the report was received and considered, we were already aware of the complaints which were lodged with the office, and we were of the view that it would be premature to consider any disciplinary action before the findings and recommended remedial action following your investigations were known. Apart from this, as I will indicate in more detail before, below, the report contained incorrect factual and legal statements which made any steps towards disciplinary procedures at that stage not a feasible proposition. If the general limitations on page 49 of the report is also considered, it is con inconceivable, inconceivable that it could establish a credible basis for disciplinary steps against the head of department and the then fin chief financial officer. Don't worry about the merits of what, what he's saying for now, but would you agree that this was an explanation for what might have seemed to be the delay in um, uh, instituting disciplinary action, which you were accusing him of, correct? That is explanation, correct. Yes. Um, then he goes on in the next paragraph. I don't know about it. Okay. Then again, just picking up another issue at random. Remember, one of the things you were again you were accusing him of was that um, the um, department had improperly entered into a PPP. And this was another, another obviously would have been the subject of another charge or, or, or action to be taken against those who had irregularly done so, correct? Uh, through you, Chair, the PP issue initially was in the earlier iterations of the report. Matonsela version and shortly thereafter. Um, I don't know if it's the Matonsela version, Chairperson. Okay, the Matonsela version. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, I did. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry. By that I mean, sorry. Okay, you, you do know that this, this investigation started in 2013 and it was one of those that were unfinished by... Yes. Um, and, and there was a provisional report at that stage. Yes. Yes, sorry. That's what I mean by the Matron celebration. Yeah. So the triple P issue, you are quite right, came mm -hmm. from those days. From three years. Yes. From way back. Yes. And um, in so far as it was raised, this was then the explanation given by the um, um, Premier. It says, uh, if the provisions of the contracts, sorry, I'm reading from 10.05. <laughs> So basically, the, the Premier concedes the point that this was not a triple P. It says, if the provisions of contracts concluded between the department and the STIN are considered, it is abundantly clear that it does not remotely suggest that a triple P was established. The agreement concluded on 5 June 2012, record on page 316 of the department, requires the provision of certain services that the STINA will perform these services as an implementing agent. Let's just jump to the next paragraph. Is the reference to in the report, that is in the PP report, paragraph 2.2.21 to a partnership agreement between the department and the STINA is consequently completely wrong. Then says, if the definition of a triple P in Treasury Regulation 16.1 is considered a case, the relationship between the department and the STINA, it is also quite clear that a triple P as defined in the Treasury Regulation was not established. Um, next, 1006. It was also never found in the Accountant General's report that the triple P was irregular. And paragraph 2.4.8 of page 27, as well as paragraph 2 of the executive summary on page uh, Roman 3, it was clearly indicated that the investigation revealed that the project is not a, a P, triple P underlined. The, the accountant general's report, you would agree, was one of what I call the underlying reports. It's a report that had already been concluded before the matter was given to you, to yourselves. Yes, in 2013. 2013, yes. 
Um, and the point again here is, as I say, you don't have to agree or disagree with the content. The, the simple point I want to make is that these were detailed and referenced uh, responses to your Section 79 uh, inquiry, correct? Correct, yes. Um, all right. And it went on and on and on um, up to... I'll just read the headings. Um, the next heading that he dealt with in detail was supply chain management processes. That will be 1007. Okay. And then that goes on for something like um, three pages. Then the next one at 1009 is the approval of funds or funds approved. Okay. And that goes on for another appropriated. Two pages. Funds appropriated. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, did I jump one? Yes. Funds appropriated. That was the 1009. Correct. Okay. And then it goes, that goes on until 1012. Um, up to paragraph six. And then it deals with the inflation of goods issue, the one that you and I have just discussed. Correct? Correct. Yes. And again, here, this is the different uh, number of liters and all sorts of, of uh, details like that. And that goes on until the next page, 1013. Then it deals with number seven, Mahuma Mabung Dairy Project Pitua Limited. And then there's a conclusion at 1014. But anyway, so this is a 13 page detailed uh, response to your section 79, correct? Correct. Right. And um, the, so to the extent that the, these were accepted by the, public protector, and when she gives evidence, it, it will be clear that she did not accept everything. But to the extent that she accepted some of the explanations, then obviously that would affect the report and the remedial action, correct? Yes, it would. But still, even with this detailed report, at this stage, the accusations were not directed at the premier personally. Uh, when I say personal, I mean at, at him as a directly, um, as opposed to the, um, uh, oversight function, correct? That would be my understanding, yes. Yes. In fact, by the way, the, um, you know that uh, Advocate Matoncella had this, um, I almost said fashion, uh, let's say style, of giving the reports uh, flashy names. State of capture, uh, I forgot the other fancy names, yeah. Uh, uh, secured in comfort, yes, and, 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 and that kind of thing. You remember that? Yes. Yes, but public protector uh, uh, stopped that. Okay, yes. so let's also stop there where the public prevent stop. <laughs> Just ask what when, okay. when I wanted us to break for tea. Thank you. No, I, I but, yeah, go, go ahead. Yes, just so that I round off this point, yeah. Um and in in that style, this report was called by Advocate Matoncella lack of oversight. Remember that? That was the name of the of the report. <laughs> If you did read the, the, as I said, the historical copies thereof. Probably that would have been Advocate Celia who gave it that appellation, uh, Advocate Tempo. <laughs> well, uh, but it was signed by Advocate Madonza. Yes. Uh, yes. No, I do understand. You, you're quite right. I do understand that there, used, there was some lottery of, I don't know, of lack of a better word, that, that there used to be some competition as to what a particular... So, uh, so even though the name was attributed to Advocate Matoncella, it may have been suggested by somebody else. But you, you, you do remember that that was the name of the report. And the point I'm really making is that the emphasis on this, both as at the level of the complaint and the level of the report was on the oversight 
uh, functions of the politicians, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, before, uh, Advocate Bauer. I just, just want to, to clarify something. It's a correction. I think Advocate Mpofu didn't mean that. There was no report signed by Advocate Madam Sala. Okay. Well, I mean, the provisional report that uh, she had prepared. Sure. Okay. Do you understand? When I said, um, uh, thank you, Advocate Bauer, you, you do understand, uh, Mr. Ndo, that I'm, I'm referring to, let's call it the handover report that was yeah. um, received by the current PP when she took office. Yes, the, the report that, uh, whether it was a draft, yes. that that will get my Donzella left in the office. I, I understood you to mean that, yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you, colleagues. We're back at 10 to. We're Recording paused. stopped.
for cross examination. I hand over to Advocate Mbofu. Um, th thank you, Chair. Um, right. Just on a, on a I'm sorry, a, a, a separate topic. There are two issues around the topic of beneficiaries. One of them we have covered that um, that's regarding the outstanding information from Mr. Maimane, correct? Correct. Right. Then the other issue is that at least this is one issue where everyone seems to agree. Mr. Samuel, um, and even Mr. Kekana, and um, anyone else who was involved in this, was that it was the view, the collective view of the team, that um, there was no need to get into details on the issues of beneficiaries. I and mean, that was not the focus of the investigation, correct? Correct, based on the issues that were identified for investigation, yes. Yes, and uh, this view, as I say, everyone ranging from Mr. Samuel uh, seems to share this view. Do you share that view as well? I did, yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, and again, if you do the, what you call it, forward gazing, um, we know that sub subsequently, the um, portfolio committee felt that the, the second issue, apart from the issue of the politicians' direct involvement, the, that the issue of beneficiaries also needed to be probed. And it was probed in the, let's call it the second round report. You may or may not know. Are you aware of that? Uh, I'm aware of that. OK, thank you. And that report was released in 2020, I think. You're aware of that? Well, you know that you might not know the date, yeah. but you know that that, that, that you know, I, I I do know the a, a report that it, was it, released. It was completed. Yes, yes. thank you. <clears throat> right. Uh, so uh, just checking something here. All right, if you go to page 3742, which is LRN uh, 15. Are you there, slow tempo? Okay. Oh. Okay, we're well, ready there. Um, okay, just I'm just uh, sweeping on some of the issues that we've already covered. This was. Um, um, correspondence from the PP to you and others um, on the 7th of February 2018. Can you see that? Yes. That would be the day before the release of the, of the report. Of yes. The report. Yes. yes. And uh, these were some of the issues that she, she was still raising, even at that stage. Uh, issue one is confusing. 
a response to section 79 not included in all issues in dispute. Mr. Ndo and team, let's meet at 10 in the morning. Not happy with some of the information. Uh, Masisi, bring along your comments. So this was a, a wide ranging uh, commentary and instructions to various people uh, at the last minute, correct? Correct. And the purpose of me putting this up is just to demonstrate that Miss rather uh, the public protector even on the seventh was not aware that you were on leave. I think you covered that last week. Yes. Yes. Um, and so that's why she was still dishing out instructions with your name, correct? Correct. Well, and we now know that uh, you were not available for that meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning because you were at your interview, correct? Correct. Uh, all right. Um, and another, more importantly, the... Um, Public protector was still putting emphasis here to the response to the Section 79 um, notices, one of which is the one we just read from the Premier, correct? Correct. And that would have by now included the response to your follow up letter, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, Again, you may not remember it blow by blow, but the response to your follow-up letter, did it cover some of the issues that you raised? Through uh, Chair, you made the response from the Premier. Yes. Yes, I think it did cover some and... and... Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay, so you were not happy, I mean, you were happy. Uh, you may not have been 100% happy, but you didn't have to do another follow-up. There was no further follow-up, no. Okay, thank you. All right. Then, um, okay, again, just to emphasize the point around the Gupta leaks. Okay, I think we've covered this, but just for the sake of emphasis, if you go to page 3811. This is now, um, you'll remember this as the version that had many comments from Mr. Namasisi. Um, you remember that version? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he says at paragraph D, which used to be C, oh, sorry, we're not there yet. At 8.11. Yes. He says that at paragraph D, which used to be paragraph C, uh, he makes the, the emphasis. And again, this is the point I was saying about thinking about something in, in hindsight. At that time, it was called, it was recent because the Gupta list had just been discovered. It says the recent newspaper articles on the emails reported on. On, reported on, sorry, that surfaced around June 2017, referring to the project were noted, but do not form part of the scope of this investigation. Remember that? Yes. Yes. And then he, then in his comment, he says, this needs to be clarified. Uh, we may also indicate, I suppose, that's what it wanted to say, that we did not investigate how the money transferred to Estina was uh, spent as the Hawks investigation is at an advanced stage. So that was, uh, again, part of the culture that you and I spoke about, that sometimes if there was another parallel investigation by another 
arm of state, then you would leave the matter at that level, correct? So that they are not parallel <laughs> investigations. As a, as a matter of principle, yes. Uh, yes, yes. And, and a matter of practice and policy as well. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> right. Um, then if you go to 38... Okay, now we covered this last week, the, the remedial action. Um, at the 8.05, please can you just go back to the 8.05? Okay, um, you were asked about this letter. Again, this was um, 7th February, 2020. This is now half past eight in the evening on the day before the release of the report. And I'm not going to go through that, but that email you'll remember, <coughs> excuse me, covered some of the concerns from Mr. Namasisi, who was one of the last lines of defense at legal services, correct? Correct. And the point I simply want to make here is that whether his concerns were addressed or not addressed is, is, is an issue for another day. But none of the issues that he raised there had anything to do with the so-called direct involvement of politicians, correct? Yes. Is, excuse me. Okay, you might want to go through that. I'm just going to read the uh, no, quick please, chat please do, so, please. so that I confirm something yeah, yeah. that I've, yeah. I've gone through. Yes. Fair enough. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let me take it to the second paragraph. You see that um, um, he still confirms that there's the, this what I call the shortage of the bank statements from Estina, yes. uh, which would be used to verify the expenditure on the projects. Is that issue we discussed about the PEN? Yes. The fact that you you, you would have the, the three-way verification. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, this is if Estina refused, we could subpoena their bank to provide those bank statements. So this was an area of concern for him, obviously. For him, yes. yes. And then the next one, he, um, there's to be looked at uh, issues identified for investigation. Uh, and he has, in other words, issues that, that may still be investigated in, a, in another round or by other people, correct? Uh, Which may be relevant to the complaint. And that's just the paragraph after the bank statement. Yes, yes, I see that, yeah. Chairperson. I think my reading of this one is he wanted this to be part of the same investigation. Okay. Yes. Um, just okay, fair enough, yeah. So it says identified for investigation. So it's not clear whether it's a external or the same, you're saying you get the impression that that's, that's my sense. Yeah, that for, 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 it might be so, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> and then the last issue that he raised is, is just to double check if the 7-9 was sent to the HOD, and he says, um, as they are, and as, Tina, as they are the key people on the project, and they are implicated one way or another, right? Uh, then, Uh, all issues that can, or raised above can be obtained and incorporated into a final report about before the 22nd, uh, February 2018. <clears throat> okay, so you're right. So you are saying that there, there would be, uh, there would have been a week or two delay. Uh, then it says there's a lot of public interest in this report and we need to ensure that we cover all the angles. So he raised those issues and uh, he would have raised them with everyone, including yourself and uh, Ms. Mkwaban. 
Correct. And you were not by that time you you were you were gone. <clears throat> so the public protector's evidence would be that these issues were then negotiated between her and um and Mr. Namasisi and everyone else. And the decision to go ahead with the release was reached, but you, you were not there. I was not party to, to that, yes. yes. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, right. If we can then now go to... Um, page seven twenty six, please. Just a bit. 37? Yes, it's the correct one. Yeah, the correct one. Okay. Can you then, uh, so that would be the memorandum, Ms. Endo, um, which came from you uh, to the PP. Uh, this is now spanning the period of your involvement um, since the previous year, correct? Correct. Yeah. And if we can then, okay, it's just a blow by blow account of what has happened. Um, which issues were investigated, which issues were not investigated uh, in quite significant detail. If you can just move, uh, fast forward to 3739, please. Seven. Yes. I'm just interested in 7.3. So these were the issues that even at that stage you were you had identified as some of the uh, Issues to be to be incorporated. Uh, the one was the recent submission, seven point two point one, recent submission from the premier's office that would have been the response from your follow up letter. Correct. That that's my understanding. Yes. yes. Uh, <clears throat> the next one was the internal legal opinion in regard to the triple P. That would be the re report from Mr. Namasisi and his team, which concluded that the this was not a triple P. Correct. Yes and which um, Mr. Tebele testified here that he prepared it for Mr. Namasisi, or, or they worked on it together. Did you know that? Uh, I, I had his testimony, Chairperson, but I, I, then I didn't know. At that stage, yeah. you didn't know. Okay, yes. fair enough. Okay. And then, um, then there was this issue of the beneficiaries, which we have covered. And then you are awaiting further evidence as undertaken by the leader of the DA, correct? Correct. Um, and then you, your conclusion was that the task team is of the mind that the draft report did focus on the issues raised in the complaint. In other words, the complaint had been covered, broadly speaking, correct? Correct. You, it was not unnecessarily expanded or narrowed, correct? Correct. 
Right. And then um, and then the test team is also aware that there are criminal processes which are being undertaken in respect of the matter. And the, the, the grand conclusion was that after the completion of the tasks mentioned in 7.3 above, the team should be able to submit a report. That, that would be a precursor to the signed report, correct? Correct. Right. And we've already covered what matters were indeed uh, resolved and which ones were not resolved. Okay, but there were no other outstanding issues that you had identified as a team, correct? Not outside of these ones that we have covered. No. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Right. Uh, okay, now. Let's go to the matter of HR-related issues. Um, and we'll start before we come to uh, the, the uh, your specific issues. We've covered the issue of the Audi letters. We've covered the issue of your response um, to there too, and the uh, resultant disappearance of the matter. Um, now, last week, you made it very clear, questioned by both Advocate Bauer and myself, that you yourself are not uh, are not here to to make any allegations um, about the PP, which su would suggest that uh, that you were victimized, harassed, or intimidated at any stage. Correct? Not as it relates to me, no. Yes, and um, you specifically. Denied that you ever told anyone that you were unfairly targeted by the PP, correct? I have never told anyone that, correct? Yes. And well, you can blame yourself for choosing the, the wrong legal representative. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, when you did have um, an HR issue, you were represented by Mr. Samuel, correct? Correct. Yes. And he is the one that said you were unfairly targeted by the PP. He certainly didn't get that from you, correct? Uh, I don't recall any such discussion with him. Yes. All right. And... And you, to the extent that you were charged, you, it was not, as Mr. Samuel put it, you were not inexplicably charged. You knew about the matter. I mean, obviously, you, I'm, I'm not saying you, you agreed to it or admitted to it, but you knew about the HR issue regard, relating to yourself, correct? Yes, because I have I, been placed on suspension, yes. Yes, you, you had to be in respect of that same matter. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, and the long and short of it is that you uh, resigned before that disciplinary hearing could take place, correct? But, uh, well, let's, let me put it this way. You, but by the time set for the disciplinary hearing to take place, you had already submitted your resignation. Yes, correct. Hmm. Um, Can I play, play something please. On, on the record as yes, well? Yes, please, please do so. My indication from the employer was that the matter was concluded. So when I resigned, I was not aware that the matter would still proceed. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's important information. So it's not as if you resigned to run away from the matter. Is that what you're trying to explain? 
Uh, yes, Chairperson. And Chairperson, can I also raise another issue? Yes. Uh, I thought this is the part if uh, Advocate Mpofu would like to raise, that would be raised in camera. Um, no. No, I'll watch that space, but yes. continue answering the questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, and, and yeah, thanks, Ms. Endo. I, I, I'm, I'm quite aware of it. That's why I'm kind of skirting around it. Uh, but um, if you feel uncomfortable, please do indicate. Um, that's why I'm not, I'm not even describing. I'm simply saying, I think as you and I have been doing now, you were aware of the issue, of the HR issue. I was, yes. Um, and and you have indicated that um, you did not your resignation was not uh, done with the awareness that the matter had at that stage been revived. Correct. Correct. Yes. Um, and you've never said that the you've never. Similarly, you've never said that the PP uh, was, was responsible for reviving the matter in order to to cast aspersions or cast shadows on your future prospects. Correct. Correct, uh, Chairperson. My my sense was it's the complainant who was pushing the matter. Yes. Yes. No, not the public protector. Okay. Now I could, yeah. All right. In fairness, Mr. Samuel did not attribute this to you, but for the record, I want to make it clear that he did not get this from you. He says in his statement, uh, I could only conclude that the PP wanted to have these unresolved allegations of misconduct on his record, meaning you, casting a shadow over his future prospects. You never told anybody this. That might have been his of you, but it was yeah. not from you, correct? It wasn't from me, Chairperson. Thank you. Um, Chair, you'll find that at page 2112 of Mr. Samuel's statement, uh, paragraph 112. We don't have to go there, it's just for the record here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, Sorry, Chair. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, there was also just just to, uh, you said you had been there for about 20 years, eh, correct? Plus minus 19 plus, minus 19 plus yes. Yes. Um, there, there, there have been, you might want to assist the committee as uh, someone who had been there um, over some time, um, particularly around this issue, because there seems to be two schools of thought. You, you've already assisted as in respect of the, the Audi letters. Um, and the, 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 there's a view advanced by people like Mr. Debele uh, that this was a, a good thing in the sense that, as it happened in your case, if someone gave a, a 
reasonable explanation, that would be the end of the matter without it getting into your record or anything like that. Would you agree with that? In my case, yes. Yes. Um, and um, there's another view um, expressed by other people. Um, well, Ooh, ooh, ooh. As witnesses, the, the one rank highly, but um, it, and it is that the granting of somebody of an opportunity to somebody to exercise their rights of natural justice to make representations was a form of harassment. You don't share that view. Uh, through you, chairperson. For, for me, it, it depends on how the Audi letter comes. Yes. Uh, if, for example, people have the perception mm. that the smallest mistake that they make, there will be an Audi letter, mm. then perhaps there might be that perception yes. that there is harassment. Okay. But on principle, to say if something has gone wrong and you're given an opportunity to respond. I mean, that that's in terms of the law. Yes. yes. Thank you. And um, in any event, I, see, I accept that. But in that situation it would obviously be better than what happens in other employment places where if you are perceived to have done something wrong, you are simply given a warning letter as as a as a first step, it's better to proceed that with something that's not going to be in your record. Correct. Comparing the two years. Yes. Right. Now, and um, anyway, you you yourself have not experienced any victimization or harassment or intimidation. Correct. Not from from where I'm sitting. No. Yes. And. Um, there have been also some bizarre statements which were made uh, here that the public protector uh, asked people to call her madam. I mean, have you ever seen head of anything like that? That's a new one to me. Perhaps it happened after I left. <laughs> I, I'm hearing it for the first time. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I know. Well, you're hearing it for the first time because it 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 it, uh, it, it was an imaginary thing. Yeah. But uh, to, in your experience, in all the years that you were there, you whether it was this public protector or any previous one that you served under, people called the person public protector or PP. Isn't it? It's usually PP. Yes. That has always been the case that from is, yes. Advocate Parkour's time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that never changed with any of the PPs that you served under? Not to my knowledge, no. Yes. Thank you. And um, <laughs> the, the, then there was another one about uh, people had to bow down to the public protector <laughs> uh, in a Buddha style. Have you ever heard of such a thing? I haven't. <laughs> All right. Um, and the last one was, uh, and, and, and this one, uh, uh, I can imagine it, that uh, when the Let's say if there was a meeting, the public protector walked in, people would stand up. Um, that was a practice that was there even before this public protector, correct? With, with meetings? Let's say there's a formal meeting in a, in a boardroom. When the principal walks, I mean, it happens, I know, in government departments. When the um, executive authority enters, some people would stand would up. Would stand up, yes. yes. That happened for, as I say, uh, with the other previous public protectors as well. I recall during uh, Professor Matonsela's time, it, it would happen. Yes. Especially you. with your top management. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, OK. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Ndo. And um, um, just, you know, if, if the opportunity arises, would you serve again uh, at, at the public protector? I, I would. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I have no further questions. Uh, thank you, Advocate Bofo. Uh, that's the end of our cross examination. Uh, I will now proceed uh, to, to members. But before that, just to say uh, on a lighter note, after lunch, when we come back from lunch, I will come in with all of you seated. I'd like when, when I come in there, starting from Advocate Mbofu, and everybody else, when the chairperson comes in there, you will all rise. Yeah. Can I, can I be the first one? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. That was uh, not a light. <laughs> During the lunchtime, chair, I'll also teach them how to bow down to you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> no, thank you, sir. No, thank you. Um, can I recognize the members? Uh, Honorable Lotrit. Uh, my name is... Uh, Andre. Aaron. Sukas. Ryan. Sakode. Siwela Skosana That's the list. Thank you, uh, honorable members. In okay. 1232. Uh, Honorable Lothrich, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And um, yes, it's already good afternoon, Ms. Sundo. Um, just in terms of your affidavit, I would just like to have clarity on the following. In paragraph nine, <clears throat> you refer to under the approach to the investigation that you sat in the CEO's boardroom to look specifically at the receipts of what was purchased at the Freda Dairy. You then state who was all involved <clears throat> and then basically um, who then left at what particular point. What was the outcome of that meeting in terms of the receipts? Because later on it is said that you still don't have sufficient information about this. Uh, sorry, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honourable Member. Uh, my recollection at, at that meeting was the only receipts we could come up with or identify were only nine receipts that related to the purchase of cattle, uh, and, and, and that was it and which then prompted me when I wrote to the Premier in response to indicate that there is still some information that is outstanding, including invoices and receipts. So that, that was how, how we concluded the meeting. Yes, I don't know if I've answered the question to your satisfaction through you, Chair. Thank you. So um, you said then, you then went to the Premier to get the additional information. That was not part of the Section 9 letters. Yes, that, that was the response to the Section 7, 9 letters. Just perhaps through you, Chair, to indicate that one of the issues that the Free State Office had indicated was that they couldn't get all the information that they required from the Premier's office or from the Free State Department. So that's why 
than when we're sitting on, on the day. One of the, well, the main task of the day was to look at what was submitted and, and then to identify what was missing and so on. That, that was the, the exercise of the day. Thank you. And were any reasons provided by the Premier's office or the administration as to why they could not produce those receipts? Uh, through you, Chair, I, I can't really recall whether there were any reasons advanced. Yes. Okay, and you didn't follow that up further at a later stage? Not that I recall, no. Thank you. Then I want to turn to paragraph 12, and that will, this refers to the um, cell phone call that the public protector made to you after that meeting. Um, how did you interpret what you state in 12.2, that the PP would personally be happy if there were no adverse findings in this report? How did you understand it? My, my understanding of that, uh, Honourable Member, was to say uh, then whatever evidence uh, is found in the investigation should not uh, we shouldn't have regard to it because then the evidence would then lead to, to adverse findings. That was my interpretation of, of that statement. Have you ever encountered this before? Uh, it was my first time. Okay, thank you. You also state further on that you actually gave um, or informed Advocate Salia of what the PP allegedly told you that um, she was doing the bidding of the DA. How did Advocate Salia re react to this when you told her this? My recollection is she denied it. And if I'm not mistaken, she actually said she belonged to a completely different party. I can't remember which, but that was a reaction. Thank you. And then my last question um, regarding the report and the one that you said you were part of the final one, the capacity and financial constraints. You also in your oral evidence now said or confirmed that um, in most instances you did suffer with from um, financial constraints and uh, capacity. Was it then um, in the ordinary course of things or normal course of things that that would be included in a report to state that we had such problems? Or was this uh, something that you were not used to? I can't recall uh, through you, Chair, any other report that might be there that that specifically referred to uh, the issue of financial constraints then affecting the the report that that's that, that this is the only one that i can recall thank you yes. thank you chairperson <clears throat> thank you honorable Latrich. honorable mananiso uh, thank you chairperson uh, let me greet uh, members on the platform and as well members in house and greet the uh, advocate um, Pofu and as well uh, well, Manani, so are, you, are you able to show your face? We've been seeing this picture. You know, Chair, I thought you said that you, you are able to see when the network is not right. So with me as well, I'm not uh, in a stable network. Okay, continue. We'll check your network now. Can I continue? Chairperson? Continue for now, yes. Yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, Chairperson, uh, let me as well welcome uh, Ndatendo. Greetings, uh, Ndatendo. Greetings, uh, Honorable Member. Uh, sir, my first question to you is with regards to your Avidavid paragraph 42. You indicate that you received a text message from the PP instructing you to return to work, but you did not. Does that not equate to insubordination as you defied an instruction from the head of the institution? Uh, 
through you, Chair. Uh, from where I'm sitting, Chairperson, I had to balance, you know, uh, how I'm perceived, especially from an outside organization that had invited me for an interview at a very high level. And the fact that already when the public protector sent me the email, I had already, <clears throat> sorry, I had already applied for leave. So th those were the two contrasting, uh, uh, you know, interests that I had to, to balance, which is why I, when I went back to the office, I expected some recrimin recrimination. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. And then my second question to you is, when you received the SMS, did you feel intimidated or threatened? How did you feel? Through you, Chair, if, if I had felt intimidated, uh, I, I would have returned to the office. The, the reason that I didn't uh, return to the office immediately because the, the, the SNS was very clear. I, I would have returned to the office, but I didn't feel intimidated. That's why I did not return to the office. I thought I would explain it on my return to the office. <clears throat> okay. Uh, then, Mr. Ndo, if you are given an opportunity to actually classify the leadership style of uh, the PP, what would you say? Let's see. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look for, for me, Chairperson. Truth be told, I, I don't think I can describe the leadership style of any of my previous principles. Uh, people have got different, different attributes and so on. So I'm not really sure I, 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 I can come out with a, an answer that makes sense to anyone sitting here. Okay. And then, uh, Mr. Ndo, on paragraph 43, you indicated that you anticipated the possibility of there being adverse uh, consequences for not going back to the office on your leave day. What do you do say that there was a culture of fear within the OPP? The chairperson, through you, for me, I mean, mo most of, you know, the top management, especially at head office, are, are legal people. So for me, uh, I, I, I would deal with, with any intended action uh, based on what the law says. So I, 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 I wasn't intimidated. I would have dealt with it on the merits like any other matter that came towards me. Okay. Um, Mr. Ndo. The manner in which the investigations was handled, do you think the PP failed the poor and the vulnerable in this regards? Sorry, through you, Chair. I didn't catch the last part. Yes, please I'm repeat, asking, Honorable Manani. Okay, so. uh, thank you, Chair. My question is, uh, in the manner in which the investigation was handled, do you think the PP failed the poor and vulnerable in this regard? My response to that one, Chairperson, is uh, not having looked at the beneficiaries, for example, and what they got from 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 this project, at, at least at the stage that the investigation had had, had been concluded, uh, it, there is an argument to be made that perhaps we, we could have, when we identified the issues, 
uh, looked at the beneficiaries because ultimately the project, from my understanding, was supposed to be about them. So it, from that perspective, yes, I, I think we could have done better. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. That's it from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Mananiso. We have checked your network, so we can confirm that it is very unstable, but the next discussion we'll have with you is a, an alternative picture next time that you can start looking at. Um, thank you. Um, Honorable Gondo. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Dumela uh, Mr. Ndulikai. Ritengu uh, I know you um, have indicated that you can't um, describe with certainty the leadership or management style of, um, you know, um, the various incumbents you've had the privilege of serving under, I mean, for plus or minus 19 years, uh, whilst working in the Office of the Public Protector. But I have to ask you this. Then how would you contrast the management or leadership style of Advocate Mkwebani vis-a-vis -vis that of Advocate uh, Madonsela? Um, I'm, I'm through you, Chairperson. I'm, I'm still. Trying to, to come up with an answer uh, that would place on the one hand advocate Mkwebane and, and the now Professor Matonsela. For me. The one thing I can say about uh, Advocate Mukwebane was it, during her, her term when I was there, there would be a lot of emphasis on deadlines, for example, whereas during uh, Advocate uh, Martin Sela, uh, that for me didn't come out as much. That, that's the, the best I can do in, in terms of, of, of comparing them. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I can be able to give you any response beyond that. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, my next question then is, as someone who occupied a senior management position within the Office of the Public Protector, mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, and, and, and I'm asking this, you know, on the basis of you having been in the office, did you ever get the distinct impression that the Office of the Public Protector and the Advocate Mkwebani maintained close relationships or links with the state security agency. I'm asking this because we heard evidence last week from Mr. Jalela that um, the Office of the Public Protector maintained close links or relationships with the SSA. He informed this committee that an, an official from the SSA, namely Mr. Prince Nchaveni Makutama, sat on the appointment panel that appointed Mr. Neshunji. We also heard from Mr. Jelena that um, the SSA even seconded someone to act as CFO at the Office of the Public Protector. My sense, given three things, would be to say I, I, I sensed that there was this open communication between the SSA and us. One, uh, I had been involved in the project before Advocate Mkwewan came to the office to put together a case management system. And it didn't, it wasn't finalized but I was aware that at some point, uh, state security, uh, the state security agency 
then wanted to put together a system for us. So that's the one incident. The second one related to the appointment of uh, uh, Mr. Baldwin Neshunji. The fact that there was somebody uh, from state security suggested to me that perhaps there is an open communication with state uh, security. Uh, those are the, the incidents that, that I can think of. So were you there at the time that uh, someone was seconded from the SSA to act as CFO? Yes, I was there. Uh, do you recall the name of the gentleman? No, I, I cannot. It's, it's quite some time back. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Um, do you know Mr. Vusimusi Menzelo? Muzelewa? I think it's Muzelewa. I can't recall the name off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we heard evidence from several witnesses suggesting that Advocate Mkwebani uh, um, made, you know, top secret security clearance a prerequisite for um, some of the employees at the Office of the Public Protector, especially senior officials. Um, do you know why this was the case? And to your knowledge, did officials of, you know, senior officials of the Office of the Public Protector um, work with documents that can be categorized as being classified or top secret in the course of their day-to-day -day duties? Uh, sorry, Richard. The issue of uh, top secret uh, pre-dated uh, Advocate Mukwevane's time I, for one, for example, by the time I left, uh, I had a top secret uh, clearance that had just expired. Uh, th th this dates back to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor Matonsela's time. On the issue of, of document classification, my sense is that we didn't then go to the next step of saying this document is classified as top secret, so it can only be seen by somebody who's got a top secret clearance. I don't think we, we went to that second step, but the, in terms of uh, the security clearances, there was top secret, there was secret, and so on. Yes. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um I now want to ask you questions around the Friday investigation. In paragraph 14 of your affidavit, you say that you left the meeting that was held in the C CEO's boardroom to go home. And on the way home, the PP called you to tell you that um, Advocate Silias was doing the bidding of the DA and that she'd be happy if there were no adverse findings made in the report. You stated in your evidence in chief that you understood this to be more of a desire than an instruction. If this was indeed a desire on the part of Advocate Mkobani um, and not an instruction, why do you think she felt the need to convey this desire specifically to you and not to, um, for example, Advocate Mshonyeni? Uh, through you, Chair, I, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, I was just reporting the contents of the conversation that we had. Uh, I, uh, my sense of the top of my head would be since I was the highest person in the branch that dealt with the matter, if she wanted to... <clears throat> express a desire, then it would have been to me. That, that was my sense. Thank you. You stated in your evidence in chief that you shared what the public protector told you over the phone with your team. Please confirm if you shared this with Mr. Kekana and Mr. Samuel. And if you did share it with them, um, please indicate what you said to them. Um, did you tell them that 
um, you know, she said this, but I believe that it was more of a desire than an instruction. I'm asking this because Mr. Kekana informed this committee in his evidence that the instruction to not make any adverse findings against politicians from um, Advocate Mukobani was relayed to him by yourself. And this was corroborated by Mr. Samuel in his evidence. Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Member. What I shared is what I said in my affidavit, the way it was expressed to me. Uh, I don't recall a discussion going into specifics whether this would include uh, not making findings against uh, politicians. Uh, I wouldn't want to come here before the committee and say, it was a specific instruction to say don't make findings against uh, politicians. I reported it to them as I recalled the conversation, which is what I've included in my in my affidavit. And, and I did share it with uh, Mr. Kekana because he was part of the team that was assisting me. I did share it with uh, Mr. Samuel as well, since the report emanated from, from his office. Um, in your opinion, why then was Advocate Silius subsequently removed from the investigation and excluded from the task team that was established to finalize the report? If what Advocate Mkwabani said to you over the phone was merely a desire or a wish and not an instruction? The, the task team uh, through you, Chair, was my own initiative. Uh, it, it was a task team of people who were in the vicinity within Pretoria. All the task team members were stationed in Pretoria, and that's the reason we did not include uh, Advocate uh, Silie, because the file had been brought over to, to head office, and the task team would be sitting uh, together and going through the file itself. Which would which would have been a bit difficult to include uh, Advocate Lear, who was still stationed at uh, at the Free State Office. So you did not. That will be your last point. Let's check your time. Okay, last. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so you did not exclude um, Advocate Celia from this task team because Advocate Kobani had indicated that she was doing the bidding of, of, of the DA. Not at all. All right. My last question, Chair. So in paragraph 43 of your affidavit, you state that when you returned to the office uh, from leave, you received a notice, a notice in the form of an Audi letter. Am I correct? Correct. Uh, please confirm who issued you with the notice and whether you believe um, that this notice was issued under the instructions of Advocate Mkobani. Uh, as far as I can recall, the notice was from Ms. Ntoriseng Mutsitsi, who was then acting as the CEO or COO, but I think it was CEO, and I reported to her directly then. Uh, I, 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 I had no inkling for example, that this would have been at the instruction of, of the public protector itself. But I'm sure the issue of my being on leave on the day and the fact that uh, the public protector had uh, sent me an SMS saying my leave with withdrawn would obviously have been an input from the public protector. As to whether it was an instruction from me, I can't really speak to that chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Gondo. Um, can I recognize uh, Honorable Aaron? Good chair. Um, Mr. Sindor, I just want to go back to um, your first involvement with the, the Freda report. Um, were you involved in the Freda investigation prior to the task team being established? Um, in late 2017, had you had any prior involvement with the freedom matter? 
No, I did not. And did you have any awareness of the Freda investigation at that prior to um, heading up the task team? Uh, yes, I would have, because it would have served before the, task, the, the think tank, yes. And um, does this go back to um, the period when Advocate Saliers was heading the investigation in the Free State um, under the previous public protector, Advocate Maron Sela? Were you, did you attend think tank meetings yes, I did. during that time? Yes, I And the Freda report was discussed at those think tank meetings? I'm, I'm not sure at what point it was placed, but it would have been at some point, yes. So you were aware of the report before then? Yes. Before you took over as, as part of the task team? I would have, yes. And in that time, can you recall if Advocate Maruncela ever issued instructions that politicians should be investigated at any of the think, think, think tank meetings? I, I really can't recall. So, because Mr. Samuel um, gave evidence that um, Advocate Maroncella was never happy with the report that was being drafted in, in the Free State because it didn't implicate politicians. Did that ever come up at a think tank meeting? Not, not that I recall. And so at a think tank meeting, meeting that you can recall, was there ever an instruction from Ad Advocate Maroncella to Mr. Samuel or to the Free State to include politicians in the investigation? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. When, um, when the, the matter was handed over to the head office and you were asked to form this task team, um, how did the task team work? Did you? There were four of you in the task team, is that correct? Mr. Kakana, Advocate Redani, Mr. Satoli, and yourself. Uh, person, just, just to indicate that uh, I, I was not instructed to form a task team. It, it was my, <clears throat> my own initiative. And the reasoning behind that was that at the time that the file was transferred to head office, I did not have investigators in my branch. They were still not yet uh, transferred to my to my branch, which is why I had to then ask the public protector to form a task team of investigators who were not within my branch then to be part of this task team. So when the when the file was handed over from the Free State to the um, head office. It was essentially handed to you and your branch, but your, it was your suggestion that a task team be established. Yes, it was my own initiative, yes. And did you, invest, did you identify who should be part of the task team? Yes, I did. And the public protector agreed to those members? Yes, that's my recollection. Thank you. And then how did you work with, with this investigation, the four, the four of you? Um, and, and I'm specifically referring back to your answer to Advocate Mpofu last week, um, where you said that you only you only looked at the latest report. Yes. Um, we had Mr. Advocate Radani who gave evidence that he read all the reports. Um, so I'm trying to understand how you worked as a task team. Was that a task that Mr. Radani had been given um, and you, you, you only read the most recent report or version of the report, but he was asked to read all the reports? I, I was not part of uh, the task team, uh, Honorable Member. They were the task team that I put together to go through the file and the evidence and, and the reports, and then they would report to me. Thank you. And did you ever look at any, any of the evidence? You mean as a task team? No, you as Mr. Endor, Advocate Endor. Yes, on, on, on the day that we, was it the 6th uh, and the 7th, when we were finalizing the report, yes, we, we, we did look at the evidence to see if it supported the, the findings. And was there any evidence um, that would implicate the politicians in wrongdoing? Beyond... 
not beyond taking action against the HOD as far as I can remember. <laughs> and finally, I mean, when Mr. Samuel gave evidence, he um, his statement, if I look at his, his affidavit, pay, paragraph one, I don't know, you won't have it in front of you, but I'll just quickly refer to paragraph 177 of his affidavit to this committee, which is on page 2133. Um, he, he, says this in his affidavit, and he, and he said this also in oral evidence, that he didn't feel that the report had gone far enough, and that in his view, the politician's wrongdoing had not been limited to failing to take disciplinary action, which I think contradicts what you've just said in terms of what you found in the evidence. But he gave evidence that he, um, he formed this view based on politicians taking ownership of the project in public and he mentioned that the Premier had included the project in a State of the Province address. Would that ordinarily constitute evidence of wrongdoing? Not from where I'm sitting, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honourable uh, Heron. Honourable Sukas. Honourable Mari Sukas from the virtual platform. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Ndo, thank you for um, coming out um, to this committee to present um, yourself. I just have a few questions that I would want to ask you. And the first is, you were acting CEO. Did you apply for, um, for the permanent position? Uh, Chairperson, just to indicate uh, that was not my first acting CEO stint, just to put that on record. And I did apply for the permanent position, yes. Were you told why you were not successful? Yes. Uh, I recall myself and Ms. Mukhalati, we had also applied for the position. We were individually called to the public protector's office and informed that uh, someone with more experience had been appointed, yes. Um, just for the sake of time, I will leave that uh, follow-up question out. I just want to um, go to the Frieda report. It has been stated that the Frieda report was long delayed, it was urgent, and it was very important for uh, the Public Protector South Africa to release it. From your evidence, the Public Protector's approach to setting due dates for reports seems to have been rather ad hoc. And for example, you state the Frieda report would have waited a few days. How were due dates um, for, for reports determined? Uh, if if, if it's at, at the task team meeting, uh, the, sometimes the public protector would uh, ask us how long uh, a report would take to be finalized and uh, then sent through to her and would give a, an indication. Uh, but sometimes, depending on, on the agency of the matter, then she would indicate that she would want the report by a certain date. Thank you. Um, was there any sort of corruption or tip off hotline at Public Protector South Africa that was monitored by an independent body um, to which staff could report misconduct or um, a whistle, whistleblower hotline? If I recall correctly through you, Chair, at, at some point, I don't know whether during Advocate Nkwebane's time, there was a, a hotline, but at some point we, we did have it. I, I can't remember the time frames between which time and which time. So are you, are you saying, uh, Mr. Ndo, that there was a place, and I'm talking about in your recent memory under the, um, under the authority of the current PPSA, 
uh, the public protector, I'm sorry, was there any place where senior staff members instructed or indicated that they wanted something improper done, where there was a safe place, staff could, uh, without fear of reprisal, report that? Not, not, not that I'm aware of in my recollection. You said uh, you were looking for another position in February of 2018. Now, let me state that when an employee puts in annual leave and says personal reasons, that that should be sufficient, wouldn't you agree? And an employee doesn't need to justify their leave. I would agree with that, uh, Honorable Member. Um, so my question, what was the reason for you at that time to look for new opportunities and eventually for you leaving the, the office of the public protector? Through you, Chairperson, uh, it was not the first time I applied for positions outside. Uh, I had been applying for quite some time. <laughs> Even before the allegations that were made against me, I had been applying for positions, including for a commissioner uh, of the Public Service Commission, where I was interviewed in, here in Cape Town. My sense was I had been in that office for quite some time, and I needed a new challenge. That, that was the reason. I, I, I didn't hear your answer earlier. I think one of my colleagues um, or committee members asked, with, um, I'm not sure, I think it was under the cross-examination, uh, perhaps, that you were asked whether you would return to the public protector's office. Um, could you just repeat what your answer was? I said yes, given the nature of the work, yes, how I would. Um, Mr. Ndo, what quality control measures were in place to ensure Rule 53 records were complete? And when it was found that they were not complete, what quality control steps were taken to ensure that these records were complete? My recollection of, of Rule 53 records is that we would be asked to bring over the file to legal uh, and then legal would, would then look at the file in terms of what is there uh, relating to reports and so on and and if there is a report that's missing then they would ask us for if, if we've got uh, copies of the report but th that's my that's my sense it would be done at uh, at legal services then they would indicate to us what is missing uh, it, it's not something that was done at, at branch level um, I think my question goes perhaps to the issue of when they, when the organization or the, or the public protector was fined lacking in that regard, um, in your experience, was anything done, um, corrective measures taken, um, or quality control measures improved when there were gaps identified? Not so necessarily internally, I understand the internal process, but externally when there was adverse findings of any kind um, that um, pointed towards um, gaps such as incomplete records, um, was there any um, corrective measures put in place? Not, not that I know of, uh, Chairperson. Um, you worked with many public protectors. Um, anyone other than Advocate Mkwebane ever express a wish, um, like the wish that, you, um, that she expressed to you as per your affidavit? Uh, no, Chairperson. Uh, my apologies, sir. I couldn't hear you. I said uh, no. Um, was there any other person, Mr. Ndo, other than yourself, and I heard your answer earlier, um, that you know of that felt targeted, bullied, or intimidated by the public protector? Not anyone who expressly express that to me, no. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ndo, for your answers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Sukas. Thank you, Mr. Ndo. That takes us to lunch. We will pause and be back at two. And we'll start with Honorable Milan. <laughs> Um, I will not say rise for lunch, but you can go for lunch. <laughs> Recording stopped. Yes. <laughs>